I think we all intuitively understand that as we get better at making computers, they get faster. And that the same goes for GPUs, graphics processing units. Today's GPUs are incredible feats of engineering, cramming hundreds of teraflops of compute performance into minuscule packages with seemingly no end in sight to the performance gains. But where did this all start, and just how much faster are modern GPUs than their predecessors? How many original GeForces does it take to equal one RTX 3080? That was the question I set out to answer at the start of this year, and through complications, setbacks, dead GPUs, and way, way too many Windows installs, I can present part one of this endeavor in time for GPU June 2. This video will cover all of my early PCI and AGP GPUs, from the S3 Verge up through the Radeon 9800 Pro and GeForce 6600 GT. Part 2 will pick up where this one leaves off, benchmarking my PCI Express cards from the Radeon X700 and GeForce 7800 up through my recently acquired RTX 3080. My goal for this project is to take all of the benchmark data I've gathered and synthesize one big graph spanning literal decades in computer evolution where you can see directly how much faster a particular GPU is versus any other. Sound cool? <laughs> well, alright. Bottoms up! As I said in the intro, this is part one, covering PCI and HP graphics cards. If you want to see that one big graph I was talking about, it's at this timestamp right here. Or keep watching if you want to learn about the computers I built for this benchmarking, or the benchmarks I chose for each card era, or how I wrangled all this data into a single graph. Still with me? Thanks. Let's start with the test systems. The hardware is my first love, after all. In total, I ended up building five test systems for this benchmarking. I started the hardware side of this project by putting together this Socket A Athlon XP that I had teased in the single chip Socket A video from a few months ago. This is an evolution of that chipset, again with Universal AGP capped at 4x speed, but much, much more compatible than the previous board. It turns out that this board, the ECS K7S5A, is kind of notorious in the retro community, and the Pro version with its stunning purple PCB can fetch quite a price on eBay. This is the non-Pro version, which, along with its brown PCB, differs from its sibling by eschewing upgraded third-party audio and LAN chipsets in favor of the ones built into the SIS735 unified mainboard chip, as well as forgoing any settings for overclocking. Here's a quick rundown of the board's specs. It's a Socket A Athlon board supporting 100 and 133 MHz Athlons, so anything from the early Thunderbirds all the way up through Thoroughbred will work on this board. It uh, unfortunately does not support Barton, which is really a shame, because that extra level 2 cache could really come in handy with bus speeds that are this constrained. The board does have a party trick, thanks to its chipset, and that is that it can run either vanilla SD RAM at 100 or 133 MHz, or DDR1, all the way up to DDR400. Sorta. Of. It'll only run it at DDR266 speeds, but it does actually do it instead of, like, flipping into a limp mode or refusing to boot, which a lot of boards of this time period would do. For example, I threw a random 1 gig stick of DDR400 in it, and it just worked. Lastly, speaking of just working, I want to mention that AGP slot. Like its older sibling, this is equipped with a universal AGP slot, and it's capped at AGP4X speeds, but it gave me zero issues with any card I threw at it, assuming the card itself was still functional. Rest in peace, my original Radeon SDR. <laughs> For performance reasons, I tried to test all the AGP cards primarily on the next system I'm going to talk about, but it did have some compatibility issues with a handful of cards. I mentioned it, so I may as well move on to the next system I used for AGP benchmarking. That's the Windows 98 for a week system. Here it is, exhumed from its case and just being a test bench thanks to my 3D printable test bench stands. This system is, of course, based on a 2.2 GHz Athlon 64 on socket 754. It's using the VIA K8 M800 chipset, one of VIA's highest performance AGP chipsets, and one that saw adaptation to a number of CPU sockets back in the day, 
I just about used its sister board, this P4M800 based ASRock, but it was having RAM compatibility issues, and even with a dual core Pressler Pentium D, its single core performance would have been pretty far behind the Athlon. So the heart of this test bench then is the Biostar K8 VGA-M motherboard, using the aforementioned VIA K8M800. It uses DDR400 memory, running at DDR400 thanks to the integrated memory controller of the legendary Athlon 64 CPU, and connects to video cards via AGP 8X at 1.5 or 0.8 volts. It's quite a bit faster than the Athlon XP, especially at lower resolutions, where the older system's architecture really starts to bog down the K7 core in the Athlon. A few cross-platform tests confirmed that performance is indeed identical with both systems with the same card when the resolution is high enough to sufficiently bottleneck the graphics card. I figured I was set with these two test systems, but during testing I found that two cards I own simply refused to work for me, even in the ultra-compatible K7S5A. If I'm being honest, these were not a surprise. So the last system I used for AGP PCI testing is my beloved Pentium 3 750 on the Gateway 2000 440BX board. It was responsible for testing two cards, my original Voodoo Graphics and the Intel i740. The Voodoo is a bit speed sensitive and wouldn't initialize correctly on the Athlon, and the i740 requires an Intel slot 1 chipset to function thanks to its use of undocumented features in the AGP bus protocol. So I dug out another test bench print, put all the components together, and it, voila, it worked. So that's all the hardware I'm using for the testing. How about the benchmarks themselves? How do you benchmark almost three decades worth of video cards? You need a benchmark that's graphically intensive enough to stress out the cards you're testing, but is also optimized enough that the cards won't be bottlenecked by these older CPUs. For example, Early 3D marks, 99, 2000, even 2001, are notorious for turning into CPU benchmarks once you get a powerful enough graphics card in your system. So with that in mind, I chose four games for benchmarking these early PCI and AGP graphics cards. The first game, and the one I knew would run out of steam the soonest, but was really essential for benchmarking the really early cards in my collection, was the retail version of Forsaken. Forsaken's a really early DirectX 5 game with dynamic vertex colored lighting and blended alpha particle effects as its only real features. It was early days. Give it a break. But the game engine is simple enough that it can scale to many hundreds of frames per second on pretty modest CPUs, allowing me to compare performance directly for cards from the S3 Verge all the way into the GeForce 256 era. It is hampered by limited resolution support, maxing out at 1024 by 768 16-bit color, so I only really used it for the lowest end cards in the list. The second game, and the one I was able to run on just about every card in the test, was the demo for Expendable. This, <laughs> this game, this game was really Ashes of the Benchmark of 1998. <laughs> it was a game that showed up in almost every GPU benchmark test of the time, but I don't think I've ever actually seen anyone play. <laughs> Expendable is a DirectX 6 game and makes use of just about every DX6 feature that was available, including the very fancy environmental bump mapping that was exclusive to Matrox cards for quite some time. Being DX6, it does not care about transform and lighting support in a GPU, instead punishing the card's pixel and texture pipelines with copious amounts of alpha particle effects and dynamic lighting. It also scales up to any resolution or color depth that you'd like, or that your hardware can support, making this a game you can play in 1080p if you'd like. For DX7 and DX8 testing, I've included the flyby benchmarks from Unreal Tournament 2003 demo. The demo includes a benchmarking utility that lets you pick your resolution, then runs through a series of tests automatically, and presents you with the results. UT2K3 is based on the Unreal 2 engine and is a DirectX 8 game, but like most games of the era, it included a pretty competent DX7, DX6 fallback render that supported the feature-constrained GeForce 2 MX and GeForce 4 MX cards that were very popular and flooding the market at the time. This makes it a pretty ideal benchmark for this tumultuous period of PC gaming. Finally, for testing actual pixel shading performance, I've included the Code Creatures benchmark from Code Cult. The Code Creatures engine never really took off before DirectX 9 arrived on the scene and stole DX8's pixel shading thunder, and as, a, as such, it is really just a synthetic test. 
However, it doesn't run any complex animations and is very punishing on the cards from a fill rate and pixel shading perspective, so I've used it for testing any cards that can run it, anything from the GeForce 3 and Radeon 8500 onwards. That leaves one little tiny itty bitty step, one minuscule little detail in my data collection plan. How the heck do I reconcile all this data into a meaningful visualization? I was so relieved when I completed benchmarking all these GPUs about a week and a half ago, until I realized that I'd have to turn all this data I'd so happily gathered into something useful. F**k. I knew from a basic perspective that I wanted to arrange the cards in order of relative performance to one another, so I threw all of my benchmark data into a spreadsheet, added a column I've called GPU units, and assigned a, a random card a value of 1. That would allow me to divide the frame rate figures of the other cards by this one, and then rank them according to this card's performance. If a card got a third of the frame rate in a benchmark than this one, then it stood to reason that it was a third as powerful, assuming that neither card was CPU bottlenecked. Confident that my methodology was sound, I set my G4 6600 as the reference card and got to work in the spreadsheet. Of course, I couldn't just use one card as the reference card. Any card capable of turning in useful numbers in code creatures, for example, was guaranteed to bottleneck on Forsaken if it was even able to launch the game. I worked around this in a similar manner. I chose a handful of cards to use as bridge cards and scaled other GPUs' performance relative to them. This worked surprisingly well and gave me pretty solid results when I checked them against the 6600 GT. So that brings us to the big graph. Here it is. Let's talk about it. You might be thinking that this looks a bit severe, with the Radeon 9800 Pro and the 6600 GT hanging out there on the end, looming over everything else, and you'd be right. I'm missing a few GPUs here, notably uh, any non-MX GeForce 2s or 4s, or any high-end GeForce FX cards that would have been attempting to compete with ATI's R300 lineup at the time. These would help smooth out this curve here and make it a little less abrupt, but also this graph is only half of the story. The end of AGP was the start of a real GPU arms race. That will be covered in part two, so for now I want to turn your attention to the other end of the graph, the low end. Here is the slowest card in the lineup. Unsurprisingly, it's the infamous S3 Verge. It scores a 0.4 in my 100-point normalized testing. This isn't the fastest model of Verge that was ever produced, but it's the fastest model that I own, and it's the most common model that existed at the time, the 325. And no matter what, fast is not a word you use to describe any Verge. This was the state of the art in consumer 3D graphics in 95, a 3D accelerator that frequently made your games run slower when you used it. That was until 3D effects arrived on the scene in 1996 and unveiled their first product, Voodoo Graphics. The Voodoo 1 scores a 1.6 on my normalized testing, fully four times faster than The Verge. Can you even imagine a top-of-the-line graphics card coming out and instantly being four times faster than the most popular card on the scene? This is why 3D effects was so popular in the 90s. They single-handedly made PC 3D gaming a reality. Anyway, Stepping back again, this chart is sorted by GPU unit, the synthetic performance rating that I've calculated for each of these cards. If I instead sort it by release year, you can see our exponential trend line become much more obvious. Here, I'll drop it in for you. I also did one more sort, and that's by DirectX support level. We have DX5 on the left, the Voodoo one is technically a DX5 card, a huge swath of DX6 cards in the middle, and DX7, 8, and 9 on the far end. I'll leave this up for a second if you want to see it. I just want to go off script for a second and say uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say about the graph at this time. Uh, it is basically a distillation of the story of the rise of the 3D accelerator told in performance numbers but there are a lot deeper stories to all of this. Several other folks on YouTube have dug deeper into these stories, uh, stories like the rise and fall of 3D effects, 
or the catastrophic miscalculation that was the GeForce FX series, or the meteoric rise of ATI's R300 series. I don't have time to tell those stories here in the interest of making this video not an hour long. <laughs> So where does that leave me? And the question that I posed at the top of this video. Well, at the moment, I don't know how many original GeForces it takes to equal one RTX 3080, but that's in the works. Part two of this video will be out soon. I swear, it won't take six months to compile this time since I already have all the systems built and I have the techniques already learned. I also have a couple of other videos planned and on the way, and I'm excited to show them to you once they're ready. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into benchmarking and data wrangling with a side of vintage GPUs. If you did, could you please be so kind as to click that like button? And if you enjoy what I do here at Tech Ambrosia, I would really, really greatly appreciate a subscribe. It really helps the channel out. As always, be good to each other and have a great night.